Uh, all of our Asian coaches, friends, and supporters, uh, welcome to our first Zoom chat. My name is Mike McPio. I'm the president. I'm currently an assistant coach at the University of California, Riverside. I've been a college coach now for 10 years. Um, started at Columbia University in 2010, moved to Campbell University in 2014, and came back west to San Francisco. Now I'm here at UC Riverside. Um, eight years ago, Steve Yang, one of our speakers today, and myself, we started this association with the hopes of creating something exactly like this, what we're, what we're about to do. Um, basically a community of coaches of Asian heritage who can network and support each other to greater and greater heights. And what's really cool about this time is like we, Steve and I would always talk and like, how do we do clinics and how do we do something for our organization? And we're always thinking in person, in person, in person. And over the last two months, obviously, I'm sure you guys have all been on Zooms all over the place. So this has actually provided this incredible opportunity. So, um, you know, the cool thing about, actually, I just saw all the the people that have come in is what we've accomplished over the last eight years. It's, it's not just um, the support from all of us Asian coaches. It's also for the rest, rest of the basketball community. And, and that's really important um, because we won't grow unless we get support from everybody else in the basketball community. But, um, you know, we're really proud of what we've built. And, and I would say, you know, since we started this and, and shout out to you guys don't know him and he won't, put his face up there, but Gary Furubayashi is a video coordinator at University of San Francisco, and he's kind of the guy, the guy behind the scenes doing all these Asian coaches spotlights and doing our Twitters and Instagrams, and he's kind of a beast, so um, if you're looking for a guy to hire eventually, he's got one more year of grad school, he, he, is, he is the guy, um, so Garrett, thank you, uh, Zoom applause for Garrett. Um, what we wanted to do today in our first one is just talk about the growth process and we brought two awesome speakers one of them is our vice president steve yang and another one is anthony santos an assistant coach at cal state fullerton and i think just having them talk about their journeys um you know we have head coaches on this zoom and we have young young guys trying to get in the business on this zoom and so hopefully you know our intent is to educate and to develop and to for you guys to really leave here for all of us to leave here with something that you can utilize and apply like today so um well before i introduce steve uh if we could just have everyone mute their sound uh, i think garrett's gonna tr try to be on that and what we'll do is we'll have steve talk and introduce you know we'll, uh, explain his journey and then we'll have anthony do the same after steve and you guys feel free to just put questions in the chat and and then we'll open it up to questions after and i'll try to moderate it and and, and ask the questions that you guys put in the chat or let you guys ask them yourself. So, um, but feel free, we want everybody, we want this to be really informal in the way that you guys feel really comfortable and to get something out of it. Um, you know, the cool thing about Anthony and Steve is they've taken two completely different paths in their journey, you know, and, and, and we're, we'll talk about Steve right now. Steve's has a really impressive resume. He's been both on the men's side and the women's side of college bas basketball. He's actually, been an interim head coach for a stint there at one point. Um, he's been labeled one of the best director operations in college basketball. He's currently at the highest level you can be at. He's, a, he's at Georgetown University Women's Basketball. Um, he's also our vice president. So Steve, I'll let you take it away and uh, have some fun. Mike, man, I appreciate you. Uh, I, I need to send you a check for that introduction, man. That's awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you guys for coming on board. Uh, Garrett, shout out to you. Thank you so much for all uh, you do and will do. And um, also, uh, Anthony, thank you for sharing this platform with me and everybody else on here, man. This is great. Uh, feel free to also, when you're sending questions, uh, drop down your contacts and all the information. If you want to connect with other people on here, that'd be great. Um, I said this earlier to a friend of mine that uh, we grow together, we go together. So uh, we got to make sure that we're all growing. And um, you know, for me personally, I'll back it up a little bit. Uh, my parents are from Laos. I don't know if you guys know where that country's at. Um, it's by Thailand and uh, Vietnam. And uh, so they came here in the States. I was born here in the States outside of Chicago and Joliet. And what my parents didn't know, you know, they didn't put me in sports uh, for the longest time. They, they, I grew up typical, go try to be a doctor or a lawyer and all that. I think a lot of people here might be able to relate to that. And that was it, you know, but I was always an outdoors kid and I love being outdoors. I grew up in Oklahoma um, 
And so I started playing soccer growing up. That's what my dad knew. I think a lot of Asian kids play soccer, but I played soccer and then eventually found my way to basketball. I just love the game of basketball. Um, if, if you guys see me, I'm not the tallest guy in the world. I, you can probably see my full body if I stand up right here. You can see my full body on the screen. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's uh, something that I, I don't let it hurt me. You know, uh, uh, I don't let it bother me as much as uh, other people might think that. Um, and so not just that, but I don't let my race bother me. I know I hear it. I feel it sometimes, a lot of times. But um, I don't look at that that way. And so the more – attention I put to my height, to my uh, race, ethnicity, the more other people will too. So I, I don't want to uh, put an uh, emphasis on that. So I started uh, just playing high school basketball. Uh, when I got into college, um, it was hard. It was hard for me. I'd never played college basketball. So, um, you know, uh, I, I try to figure myself out. But, you know, parents, my parents didn't really speak a lot of English. So they said, go to college, figure it out. And I don't know if everybody can relate to me on that, but it's hard. Like people here that have parents are educated and all that. You got it. Like you, you, you got it for me. I was, it was just, I got to go figure everything out. And I still am today. Like today I still am. I just had a good conversation with a friend and trying to figure out how life is. So, um, fast forward, I went to college at Missouri state. Um, right when I graduated, I wanted to coach and I got my first head coaching job as a boys varsity head coach, and I was running JV high school, uh, junior high, and um, it was great. I, I think everybody, honestly, everybody here, and I, the head coach is on here already. I don't know if you guys can agree with me, but I think it's great to be a head coach. If you want to start your, start your career off, start it off as a head coach because you know what to expect. You know what it is that every, every, you know, every level should, should, should anticipate. And for me, I started my career as a head coach, and I loved it. Because even now, being a director of ops, I kind of can read what my head coach is wanting and needing. And so, uh, so from uh, after Missouri State, I was a head coach at Boys High School, and then I went to J, uh, Junior College, JUCO. And then from JUCO, I came back to get my master's degree. Uh, went to NEIA, went to D1, uh, went D2, and then now I'm back at D1. And you can look at my resume. I don't have to spill that. I don't want to waste too much time on that. But at the end of the day, I, I just kind of journeyed around. I started six years on the men's side. And then the eight years now on the women's side. And so um, it, it's been a blessing. I always get the question, the difference between men's and women's basketball. It's, it, it, you know, there's different whys on players, different whys on coaches. But at the end of the day, it's the game is the game. Obviously, money ma matters too. But um, at the end of the day, I, I love being around the game of basketball. And so uh, that in a nutshell, I'm going on year four at Georgetown. Um, uh, aspirations of wanting to be a coach. I do want to be a coach again, uh, but this has been great. I've got a wife and three kids, and being a director of ops has been pretty good for me to kind of spend time with the family, not having to be on the road, and uh, raising my three little kids. But other than that, and that's me in a nutshell. And um, if you guys have any questions, I'll put my stuff in, your, in there too, and I'll be more than happy to help everyone out. But I've been all around the country, so except for West Coast. I've been mid – uh, Midwest, always the East Coast, but um, I have not ventured off to the West Coast. But um, I, I've really enjoyed being a part of uh, this association, a part of the game. And uh, I, I said this earlier to a friend is that every year that I'm still involved in the game, whether it's a head coach, video, GA, Dobo, it's a win for me. And it should be a win for all of us anytime you're still in the game. I have friends that are out of the game that, that uh, will love to be in the game still in, in any capacity. But anytime you're still in the game, it's a win for me personally. So thank you again, Mike. And I appreciate you uh, tag teaming this with us and getting this rolling. So I uh, appreciate you guys and ask some questions if you guys need to. Steve, I got, I got a question for you. What, um, what's the difference with being at your level as compared to, to I guess, other mid-major levels or Division II levels? Man, that's a great question, Mike. Um, and we didn't – guys, we did not prep for these questions, man. Well, this I, forgot, is, I forgot to tell you that that question. I was going to ask that question. It just came to me right now. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good question. Um, you know, uh, Georgetown was founded, what, 1700s? And um, when I came here, it was like they have their expectations. This is what we're all about. You know, you can't go into uh, – and I'm not saying all schools like this, but I, I don't think you can go to – the biggest schools, the BCS schools and all that, and just 
expect to make a big splash. You know what I'm saying? You got to kind of keep the ball rolling how, how they got it rolling. Uh, obviously, resources is a big thing. Um, it, it's, it's a different way of how you spend your money and, and how you um, kind of put your energy and effort. Uh, there's, we've got like nine, ten people on staff. So I, don't, I used to wear a lot of hats. Now I wear like three, three hats. And I'm like, have to be great at those three things. So if you're at a lower level, I highly encourage everybody great at a lot of things so that whenever you do get move up or you keep moving up the ladder, that when coach says, hey, I want you to be great at this, excel at that. Because everybody wants, everybody wants to, to see or hire that person that's great at whether it's recruiting, X's and O's, player development, personality character like they want that so being at this level like I I feel like I have a lot of things on my mind like all the stuff that I want to give but coach is like hey this is what I want you to be great at so Mike that's a great question and another question for you so you were at Winthrop right yes sir so when, like how do you make those decisions to try to if, if you're staying at a place like Winthrop or, and, and, and how did you make that decision to make the jump to Georgetown? Like the strictly money, was it opportunity? Yeah. So, um, every great job is not a good job. I'll tell you guys that you guys have got to, um, weigh out the options and the locations matter and all that. So, uh, for me personally, it was a great opportunity for me to keep climbing for my personal uh, development. So when I left Winthrop, I became an assistant coach at a Division II school. Um, I took a bit of a pay cut, but I felt like it was an opportunity for me to be on the road, to uh, be on the floor again, and to coach. Um, that until led me to uh, George Mason. So after I left the Division II, I went to George Mason. And then uh, for George Mason, a couple of years to Georgetown. But, but how I got to Georgetown and kept climbing the ladders is that people are starting to see you. And you're starting to rub elbows with other people, right? You go to Final Fours, you'll talk to other people within your conference. And that's the thing. You guys have got to reach out to your conference coaches. There's a few head coaches on this call right now that if he or she does not know you and you're in their conference, I think that's a problem. you got to reach out to them and uh, have a relationship with them or just introduce yourself. Um, I, I love doing that, and I've done that everywhere I've been at. Uh, and funny story, I, I coached my head coach now. He was the assistant coach at Georgetown, and I saw him at a professional development. I just walked up to him, introduced myself, and uh, that kind of – I think that kind of got the ball rolling. But um, at the end of the day, like, you just got to know where you're going. For me personally, it was just a better opportunity, a great opportunity. But I just didn't – it was hard for me to leave George Mason. I, I worked for a great boss. I love her. She's great. But uh, you, you just have to weigh out the options. Got it. And – and then last question before we, and then we'll, we'll get to Anthony here, but so you're at Georgetown, you're director of operations right now. How do you get your basketball fix? Like, you know, a lot of coaches always go like, Oh, you know, I want to, I want to be on the floor or whatever it is, or oh, recruiting that we get, we're getting recruiting questions right now in the chat. Like what, how do you get your basketball fix? Like, Another great and, question, coach. Yeah, definitely. That's, an, that's a great question, coach. Um, so, Obviously, you want to make sure you bloom where you're playing, right? People say that all the time, but don't stop blooming. You got to keep blooming. And um, find ways to do that outside of your work, whether everybody has access to synergy. You should. And if you don't, find access. Make friends and reach out to them and say, hey, can I get your login? You know, whatever it is, you know, you got to find ways to, to watch film to grow that way. Um, there's basketball everywhere. Um, so for me personally, I cannot work out players during the season, but once my seniors graduate, I can work them out. So when my seniors graduate, I always give them the option, hey, do you guys want to work out? If you, still, if, if you do, let me know. Because our coaches are going to be focused on our returning players. So you, if you're a director of ops out there and you want to get your basketball fixing in, work them out. These seniors can be uh, worked out by you. And that's what I do, Mike. Um, also, just X's and O's stuff, learning, um, talking to coaches. Getting on uh, Zoom calls is good too, especially during this time. But for me, it's also watching old films. Um, I, I love watching, uh, especially when women's basketball, if you guys know, they, we went to four quarters. And I think sideline out of balance are huge now for women's basketball. So I, I've been watching a lot of uh, NBA stuff because NBA runs a lot of sidelines, sideline out of balance. And Brad Stevens is great at his stuff. Um, everybody knows that. 
And so for me personally, I just like watching uh, growing that way and seeing how they, you know, how I can bring the NBA to women's basketball and try to keep my basketball X's to nose uh, relevant in regards to my work too. But um, are you allowed to do any basketball, like, um, I guess, aid in any kind of scouting or video in your role? Or? Yeah, great question again. I don't know the rules, like, or, or whatnot, but, but there are, you know, I'm sure you're allowed to help in some way. Yeah, yeah, you, you can. You just cannot present it to the team. So if coach, uh, like, coach had me do um, our scrimmages, and that's something good, too, if you're a director of ops and you want to still be wet in the game, ask your coach, can I just scout the two scrimmages that we have? They're just scrimmages, you know, or sit down with your coach and ask the coach if I can just, uh, you know, do stuff with you and just watch over their shoulders. Um, I believe in just trying to get your work done beforehand so that whenever you're in the office with your coaches, you can help them out. Even if you're a coach right now, too, still help your, your colleagues, help them out. They may be doing something that you may want to learn and vice versa, whether it's the post, the guards. Uh, but for me personally, like uh, I did uh, our scrimmage, one of our scrimmages this past uh, last year. And um, you just can't present it. You can do all the scouts you want. And so that's uh, depending on the staff and how your head coach is and how he or she wants to divide up the duties and responsibilities. But he knows uh, we talk, talk basketball. He always asks me to give him feedback after games during halftime after practice he always wants my feedback and we'll sit and talk basketball but uh it depends on your boss my boss is really great about that he's very receptive about hearing my input cool i i just want to chime in there. so i've i've myself have been in multiple different roles and i just i just see like the head coach the three assistants and director of operations i just see as it as like a starting five like you're trying to put your best starting five together and i the one cool thing about like the NBA, for instance, I had a buddy that was an assistant coach with me at Campbell, and then he went to go work for the for the Cleveland Cavs as an intern video coordinator, which is like the low man on the totem pole. But like that didn't it didn't like affect the way that he thought. He was just a member of the Cleveland Cavs coaching staff, and that's just you know for for me, I think that's been really important. You know, I think half of my career I've been in in an operations or or a player development role, whatever the title is, um, and it's just as valuable. And, and you can be just as invaluable to the staff. I really think it's just putting the best starting five together. That's, that's the way I think about it. Um, so cool, Steve. We're going to ask these questions, some of these questions later on in the, uh, after Anthony. So sit tight. Um, so thank you, though. Appreciate it. That was great uh, just to start us off here. Um, all right, we're going to move to Coach Anthony Santos. And, and Anthony, actually, Anthony and I are, are family. Aren't we family, Anthony? We're like cousins or something. Our something, parents, something along those lines. You know, we discovered that over time. And, and what's crazy about – so this organization, again, like <clears throat> in um, 2012 at the Houston Final Four for the men's side, and we had – I think Garrett has a picture. He was going to post it. We had, like, the very few people show up. And uh, over the last, like, eight years, it's grown to, like, 150. It went from, like, 12 to 150 people at the men's side. And, and Anthony was one of the young guys who just hit me up, and he was like, hey, like – what I got to do. I'm director of operations. I want to, you know, I want to, you know, keep progressing in this industry. And we just started chatting. And, and so I'm really proud of where Anthony's not like I had anything to do with it, but it just to watch him. Now we compete in the same conference, but um, it's a really great story. Whereas like coach Yang's been at multiple different places. Coach Santos has been at one place for nine years at Cal State Fortin. And, uh, but he's been at three. He's been with three different programs, basically three different coaches. So it's a really cool story to hear. Um, he was there, started as a student manager, and he worked his way up and finally got the um, assistant coach position in 2017. And his first year, made the won the Big West Championship and made the, made the NCAA tournament, which was awesome. And that was a year that he won the Asian Coach of the Year. So, um, without any further ado, Coach Santos, take it over. Appreciate it, Mike, and thanks everybody for you know hopping on here. Everyone can be um, at all kind of places right now, so I appreciate everyone to take the time to get it here. Garrett, Mike, Steve, uh, appreciate you guys as well. Um, trying to make my long story short, uh, before I actually became a manager at Fullerton, I actually was an assistant at the high school level for three, four years, <clears throat> um, and a lot of that was just because I didn't, I didn't. One after graduating high school, I wasn't interested in playing. Um, but then I still wanted to be involved. And so four years coaching at the high school level, 
um, I went on and, and wanted to be a manager with the men's team at Fullerton. And I was fortunate enough uh, to be able to get on my head coach, uh, high school head coach. He, he was an alum from Fullerton, so he kind of connected the dots for me. And to be honest, I didn't really know where to go from there. Uh, I was a manager. I knew I didn't, I knew I didn't want to go out to the real world, so I applied for grad school. Um, I was actually supposed to go to grad school at Michigan State, um, and a couple coaching changes happened, and ended up working for uh, interim head coach Andy Newman, uh, where he basically him, Scott Waterman, Julius Hicks, and even even Bob Burton. Um, they gave me my first kind of gig into the basketball, the college basketball world, um, serving as a director of ops. And during that time, those first two years, or that first year, I was I was teaching classes twice a week. I was the director of basketball operations, basically from 10 to seven. Then I went and ref intramurals um, at our rec center. And then just to continue to supplement my income, I, uh, I officiated men's leagues on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, so I was always busy. Literally, I think my day started at 6 a.m. to get up and work out. It probably didn't go to sleep till about midnight. Um, and I did that. I did that for for a long time, and I think a lot of you coaches know, you know, you don't you don't get days off. Um, and I I think I counted it one day, and I had I think I worked four months straight, um, seven days a week. So, um, but <clears throat> after that first year, um, the interim head coach he wasn't retained, and so um, once again I was kind of like, well, what am I going to do? Is the new coach that comes in is he going to is he going to keep me on or? Um, I had a lot of questions, you know, I, I was still in grad school and I had one more year left. Uh, fortunate enough, while I was actually coaching high school or we ended up hiring Deidre Taylor from Arizona State. And um, before he even got to Fullerton, he, as uh, the associate at Arizona State, he uh, he came and recruited one of the kids that we were playing against. Um, and so I was able to meet him. Once again, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know I wanted to coach college basketball. and that's where our relationship with, with coach Taylor kind of started. So come full circle, he gets the job. We're in a room. He kind of holds me back and says that he recognizes me. I told him, uh, I, I'm pretty sure you're the wrong. You don't know who I am. Um, and kind of kept it moving, but, um, uh, ended up working for him. And I'll be honest to say three coaches in three years, he didn't trust me. And I don't, I don't blame him. He didn't trust me. Uh, probably the first half of the year, <clears throat> um, just because I was part of the old staff. I was, I think I was just kind of the guy that was the holdover because I was free and I was a grad student and I just kind of worked. Um, and so I didn't say anything. I didn't do anything. I just continued to put my head down and do my job. And I probably halfway through the year, he realized, you know, and I'm not trying to brag about myself. Uh, he realized that he, he needed me just because I knew everything. I was a student. Uh, I was part of the program for two years. I knew all the nuances and I was continuing to grow. And so um, I was led into meetings. I was involved with everything. And uh, our relationship now is, has been really good. <clears throat> and I will say that there were probably, there has been a couple of times, uh, particularly the time where he didn't hire me uh, when we first had a position opening. Um, I took that personal. I took that personal. It, it kind of wore on me a little longer than it should have. But at the end of the day, I was at Fullerton. I was there as a director of basketball operations. So at, um, I just, I had my job to do. And at the end of the year, I was going to be like, okay, you know, I'm going to let things fall wherever they fall. And I think I put a greater, more pressure on myself to, to kind of be better um, in, in all realms. Uh, I like to think of myself as a, as a self-starter. I never, I never asked for anything. I just went out and did it. I knew the rules. Uh, I knew I couldn't be on the floor. I knew all that stuff. And so, you know, I found ways to be creative and, and, and learn. Um, a lot of that was to, was, was doing film um, and having conversations with coach Taylor about, you know, different things with the program, different things with our guys, uh, administratively, um, everything. I literally kind of like what Steve said, I was involved with everything. Um, whether it was being a manager, whether it was, coordinating our schedule, uh, coordinating his schedule, um, telling him about his meetings and, and all that type of stuff. So uh, I was fortunate enough to, uh, after that one year where he, he hired somebody, he let that same guy go. And 
and shoot, that's that's how I became a head coach or not head coach, ooh, uh, an assistant coach. Um, and I've been been thankful ever since. And I think the biggest thing for for me is just being my biggest critic. I think that's that's probably the biggest thing that's allowed me to move through the ranks. Um, because like Steve, I, I never played. I played high school. I probably could have played JUCO or Division Two or Division Three even. Um, but once again, I didn't. I wasn't interested in playing. And so, my thing was be my biggest critic. Don't let anyone be harder uh, on me than myself. And I've been, I've been lucky to be in the position I am now and and continuing to grow. Cool. Um, question for you. you. You touched on this, Anthony. What does it mean? Like. What, you're working all the time or people always like label people as grinders, what like, describe what that looks like. Just so there's coaches out here and there's some coaches who have actually are head coaches on this thing right now, but what does that look like? What does it look like when you say you're working all the time and, and also are you working for, is, are you working for free? I mean, just describe to some of the young coaches what that looks like. Yeah. So, uh, assistant coach, I wasn't, I wasn't paid. I was probably getting, you know, uh, thousand dollar stipend for the whole year which is nothing uh came on as a manager worked for free got priority registration great um my time as a director of basketball operations slash grad assistant um i i was i was free i took out a student loan i was paying myself through college um and so i had extra funds for rent and all that stuff but um, all the refing and all the intramurals and the men's league, that was just for me on the side, just because I enjoyed it. Um, it allowed me to see, you know, a different part of the game, you know, um, men's league and how guy, how the game kind of passes guys by, um, arguing with them, you know, trying to win those type of deal. And sometimes it's just smiling and, you know, they don't agree with you, you just keep it moving. And so I think that in a sense helped me ha develop tough skin um, cause when you got ex pros and, and guys that are bigger than you, um, it's, it's a little different when they're, when they're yelling at you and they feel some type of way. Uh, um, but I think, I think the grind of it for me was how could I separate myself and how could I be different? Um, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit later. Like there's not very many Asians or Filipinos or whatever in the game of basketball. And so my thing was how, how am I going to be different? Um, and I didn't go in with a set plan, you know, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. My thing was just work, put my head down, something comes across my desk. It's mine, whether it's my duty or not. And that's the thing with our head coach. He assigned all of us duties and he made me, he had me put it together. We edited it between, uh, between me and him before we brought it to the staff. And at the end of the day, when I walked out of that meeting, I felt like that whole sheet was my responsibility. Um, you know, as a director of basketball ops, I can't get out on the road. And so I watch, you know, whenever film came across my email or if we were recruiting kids, I'd, I'd look at them on YouTube or, or Synergy or however I could just to get a feel. So that way, when I was in those talks with recruiting, I could maybe say one or two things. Um, or if me and him are talking, I could kind of chime in, hey, coach, you know, I know you like this guy, but this guy, he kind of, he does this and this. So kind of, you know, kind of once again, just, just finding my way. And I don't think there's ever a script for that. And I just, you label that, I label that as the grind. And, you know, like everyone on here, you could be, you could be doing anything else. You could be at the beach, you could be with your kids. You can, you could be doing a lot of different things, but everyone's on, on here today. So I consider that as part of the grind. Like I'll be in front of my laptop from now until uh, later tonight, whether it's another zoom or whether I'm watching film or, or whatever it is, you know, that's, I don't, I'm fortunate enough that the only person that's supporting me is me and I have all my time. So um, I try to, I try to dedicate as much to it um, as I can. And a lot of that for me too is someone on this call, in my opinion, is coming from my spot. Um, and I try to approach that every time. So um, he's, he's a really good friend and guys that have come through that have, uh, been our director of basketball ops as much as I try to help them mentor them you know show them the ins and outs I also and this is just my my own personal deal but I treat them as a threat to me um, and so I have to be better 
in all realms. They, they bring something different to the table. And so I have to make sure I, I'm on top of my game so that way, you know, they don't overpass me. And I hope they do. But once again, I'm my own biggest critic and I'm going to continue to push myself. Steve mentioned it, and we'll open it up to questions for everybody. But and Steve, you can you can start to answer some of these. But Steve mentioned it. I remember for myself the same thing. Like the, the there was a moment where I actually could make a living doing this, and it was there was a moment, you know, because when I was in New York City at Columbia, it wasn't like. And I always tell everybody, everybody that wants it, because the question I'm going to ask you is like somebody asked, "What is some advice for us trying to get our foot into coaching?" Um, and so I always tell everybody, don't do it, because the person that I asked when I first said I wanted to do it told me, don't do it. It's because you're going to be working for free. You're going to be working all hours. Um, but I will leave this question to you guys to answer. What is some advice for a young coach trying to get our foot into coaching at a high level? It was his question. So, Steve, Anthony, either, either one of you can start. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of ways to answer that. I, I think – if you're, if you're looking to go through the front door of every house and forget it, I think there's so many different ways to get inside a house, whether it's the window, the chimney, the back door, the garage. And if you're, you're at the front door knocking and you're going to be, and I'm talking to the Asian people too, if you're going to be, all right, well, let me knock on the door. The door's open. Let me, let me take off my shoes before I get in. If you saw I don't make it messy, then, then, then there, someone else is going to uh, jump through that door already and shut the door and lock it. You can't get in anymore. So my thing is get your butt in the door as fast and quick as you can. And once you're in, once you're in, close it, lock it, and then you can clean up the mess afterwards. But making sure that you know what you're doing, your intent of getting in any way, whether it's camps, whether it's just go and watch their practice, building relationships, and being genuine about that. I mean, all, all that matters, Coach. Um, and that's a good question. Everybody wants to know there's no set A, B, and C how to get involved. I think it's a matter of finding ways to be intentional about it. And there's so many nuggets I mean, I can give. I mean, those are some things, camps, going to practice, writing them letters, uh, texting them, just staying in touch with them, getting to know them. Um, it's more about them than you, in a sense. But just finding other ways in the front door just, just to get involved in their program. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I have basically the same answer as Steve. Um, I also think it's what are you willing to sacrifice? Um, you know, not having, not getting paid, doing more work. Um, like there were a bit, there was a couple of times where I was like, man, I'm, I'm crazy swamped. I might just sleep in the office and see how long I could work. And as soon as I wake up, I can just walk over to my computer and there I am. Now I never did that, but there were times I thought about it. There were times I thought about it. Um, and once again, it's, it's the sacrifice that you're willing to make for w whether it's coaching, whatever it is you're doing. Um, everything comes with a price. And what are you willing to pay? So what, you know, we're here on the Asian coaches thing. And so I think it's important for us to, to, to talk about it. Like for you guys, what sets, what does set us apart? What, what are the positives of being an Asian coach? What does set us apart? Mm, that's a tough one. Steve, you can go first. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, for me personally, like, we, I, I asked this question to our uh, men's coaches here at Georgetown, <clears throat> and, uh, and I asked, well, where, where do you kind of put us in? Like, are we Asian? I mean, are we black? Are we white? What are we? And, you know, um, I, I would say we, we are the definition of diversity in sense, right? So if you're in a room with uh, black and white, and like, all right, well, and then you add an Asian person, <clears throat> or Hispanic person, all of a sudden it gets a little more diverse. But I always tell myself, like, all right, you got to be the, the diversity. Um, also, like, it makes us special is that we have a different type of mentality, too, in a sense. For me, personally, like, Coach, I, I believe that, you know, you have to be special any way you can, no matter what. Like, and I don't want to put light on my ethnicity too much. And I get it. This is what I am. But I try to focus on what I can control. I can't control that I'm Asian. I can't control – my gender or anything like that. But what I can't control is my work ethic. They can't discriminate that. <clears throat> your hard work. They can't discriminate at that and, and, and who you are, your character. So, um, you know, for, for you to be special, I, I always say uh, be a vowel, uh, be an A-I-O-U because you can't spell a word without uh, a vowel. You know what I'm saying? So if you, you are that, they, they can't not have a program. They can't have four Tim without Anthony. They can't 
have, uh, you know, Riverside without you. So for me personally, I just got to, I think you just got to make yourself special in a sense where they need you regardless. Yeah, no, and that's, I think that's a good, good point. Um, you know, my whole deal was my, my experience was going to be different than anyone that came on staff. Um, I had been on campus the longest. And so I'm a, I'm going to, I'm going to use that to my advantage. You know, you can't not get around Fullerton and not have me to ask or to be around or to advise or whatever. Like we have two, two new assistants or we just had, they just finished their first year and their whole thing was they, they came to me on, on whole, a lot of different things was, you know, what, what it takes to get kids into school or what rules this, what rules that, uh, how do we do this? And my biggest thing was just being invaluable. Um, and I'm, for me, I never, I never took it as, you know, um, I'm Asian. I just, I went out and worked. I, you know, race, skin color, whatever. It didn't, it didn't affect me. Now with our staff, I'm, I'm a little bit of a chameleon. Um, we joke, you know, sometimes about uh, race, but it's all fun and games. Uh, but for me, it, we're, we just try to, we just try to do our best. Everyone on our staff has a certain specialty and, and we, we make sure we, we complement each other well with those things. And if we don't know, we try to figure it out. And I think that's, that's, that's probably the biggest thing with any, any coaching job, you know, is how, how are you going to figure things out? And sometimes <clears throat> you, you have the resources, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get told no by your resources. So how are you going to make it work? How can you be creative in getting um, getting to your end goal, whether it's a little bit different or exactly what it is? But I think every everyone can kind of shape that, you know, depending on where you're at, what your situation is. And I think the most important piece is, you know, what do you bring to the table? Everyone on this call has something that I'm not good at at all whether it's X's and O's, whether it's, uh, you know, skill development, whether it's recruiting, whatever it is, like my biggest thing, that's why I love these Zoom calls. And it's a little different for me talking right now is because I'm always listening. I'm always taking notes and I'm studying. I'm trying to figure out how I can implement, how I can practice the things that I learn, uh, because I think that's, that's important. We all, everyone right now, especially we're all gathering all this type of knowledge um, whether it's drills, X's and O's, you know, terminology, but how, how are you going to practice it? I think that's, that's a huge thing. And once again, it's how, how are you going to make yourself invaluable? And I think you need to understand whoever you work for, or if it's your program, um, not everything fits into that. And so what are you going to take from everything you're learning to be able to help your program and, and help you change? And a lot of that is, is me just having conversations with my head coach. Um, learning from him, hearing these types of things, and now I'm regurgitating it. And, you know, it's, it's easier for me to understand versus maybe one of our other two assistants or our ops. And I'm not saying that they don't understand, but everyone takes things differently. And I'm lucky to have a really good relationship with him to be able to understand where he's come from, where he wants to go. And now I can help him steer that ship. And for me, that's my way of being invaluable. And, and Anthony said something that you keep saying that word invaluable. And I remember I've, I heard that from when I first started. Too. And you got to figure that out is what I'd say. Like that, that, that is true. And that rings true. And, and eventually we'll have the head coaches that are on here, like as part of a panel and, and just tell us what that means. But that's absolutely right. And the other thing that you, you said was tough skin. And that's something that I learned as well. Like you, you got to have tough skin in this business because it, it, it'll beat you up a little bit and, I mean, you, you have to have tough skin to take the losses in general, but just tough skin from your bosses and, or, or your superiors or, and whatnot. Um, I do want – you get, feel free to, to ask questions. I'm going to call on a couple of you guys that, you, that wrote in here. Joseph Valdesunas. Valdesunas, he's a grad assistant at Pitt. Joseph, you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, what's up? Um, yeah. So my question is, um, what is something that people starting out in this industry can easily overlook? Um, also, trying to ask the other kids, um, what is something that affects the outcome of the game? What's the game? I kind of lost you. 
I'll ask it again for you, Joseph. Um, what is something that people starting out in this industry can e easily overlook? We'll start with that. Um, and then we'll ask a second question later. So what is something that people starting out in the industry can easily overlook? Because Joseph is one of the guys who's called recently and he's a grad assistant at Pitt and he does a great job there from everybody that at Pitt. And so he, he's, what's something that people starting out in this industry can easily overlook? Um, I'd probably say uh, two things that come to mind. Um, organization. I, I feel like a lot of people aren't organized, whether it's with their thoughts, um, with what's going on in their day-to-day -day operations, whether it's, you know, whether you're ops, whether you're a video, just laying that stuff out. I feel like, you know, especially if you're doing a lot, I don't feel, in my personal opinion, I don't think people are organized enough. Like I've come across, um, different people, GAs, you know, every, every, every single position and they're not organized. They're all over the place. And I don't know if that, in my opinion, I don't think that helps. Um, and then the second thing, uh, shoot, I lost my train of thought. Oh, the relationship piece. Everyone always talks about relationships and recruiting and all this type of stuff. But what about your own players? Um, I think sometimes we lose track of our own guys just because we view recruiting as, you know, bringing that next class in and, you know, getting that next, that next player. And sometimes you lose track of the guys that you have on your campus right now. Um, and I'm not even just saying, I'm not even talking about players. Like maybe, and maybe I'm different because I used to be a manager, but the managers um, that, you know, have school and they're trying to find the balance with things. I think that's, that's a big thing that, you know, if you have those relationships with the people around you, they, you all are on the same track and now you can, I think you can get more done because you have those relationships with people. Um, and everyone always talks about relationships and, and recruiting. I think the relationships you have within your program, with your staff, your support staff, um, those are important because if you, if everyone under that umbrella is on the same page, you move forward at a totally different pace, a totally different rate. Uh, and you can get, get more done because everyone's on the same, is on the same ship. I'll add, you know, and I was gonna say relationships too, um, especially where you're at, Anthony, uh, that's, that's a good point. Um, a lot of people forget that the people you're working with might be the next boss that you're working for, whether it's your colleagues or maybe it's the assistant AD, he or she might be the AD at another school that you're gonna be working for. So whenever I said earlier, bloom where you're planted, everybody says that, that you've got to stay bloom everywhere. Um, uh, one of my managers, former managers, actually on this call, and you know we've kept the relationship, and that's I make sure that I have a relationship with my managers and GAs. If you know, if you know, it's a two-way street, but that's really important because you never know where their agenda is and where they're going to go. Um, I'll also say, kind of pivot a little bit, and I'll go X's and O's a bit too, because at a young age, when you I, there's a lot of people with family on this call, but if you're young and you don't have a lot of uh, other ties or anything, take advantage to really learn the X's and O's and player development. Because when you become a head coach, and if you want to be a head coach, you're, you're not going to be doing a lot of that. You're going to be doing a lot of kissing babies and shaking hands, and you won't have time for the X's and O's. So when you're still young and you're, you're trying to get in this industry and you're trying to figure things out, learn all the X's and O's you can. I mean, even if you don't know it, I mean, I mean even if you don't want to use it, if you don't believe in the Princeton offense, all right, whatever, but still learn it. You may play a team that runs a Princeton offense. Um, so little things like that, I would encourage at a young age, if you're, you're in the, uh, business and trying to get your foot wet and all that, I would definitely just learn basketball and be genuine and build relationships. And, and when I say build relationships, not networking, but build relationships, meaning getting to know them. And, and just to add on what the X's and O's, I learned this, uh, I wouldn't say the hard way, but I learned this with our head, with my head coach, I'll see an action that I like. And. And I'm like, coach, you know, we can run this, this, and this. These are the different wrinkles out of it. And he just automatically says, well, if you have that guy there, he can't shoot. So, you know, the defense automatically sags. And so I've been rejected plenty of times by him. Um, and I think it's a good thing because now it's forcing me to see, see the X's and O's standpoint, the game through his lens, right? Just because I like an action and I think we can, the end goal we get out of it is something that I like but the player placement, 
um, you know, where, where are they at spacing wise, or, you know, if it's a non-shooter, which we had a lot of this year, you know, they don't have to guard them at the three point line. And so, you know, having those conversations with there's, there's literally been plenty of times where I bring an action to him and I go right back to my office with nothing to show for. Um, but there's also been times, you know, Hey coach, you know, we did this, you know, several years ago, it's an action similar, boom. Okay. Yeah. I like that, you know, cause we, we get downhill or whatever it is. Um, so I think when you, when you talk X and those, not, obviously you're doing it for yourself to help yourself, but as an assistant, when you bring that to your head coach, how is that going to benefit your, t- your current team? And I have a playbook on, on my laptop and I have a, a physical playbook where I've, I've written things down um, of, of the things that I like. And so maybe every once in a while, if we want a new horn set, I can go back and look at all the different horn stuff that I have and see what works. Um, but I think just kind of being cognizant of, of who you are and how you can help uh, you, you know, your, your head coach. Yeah, I think that you have to, I think Steve's right. I coached high school basketball before I even got into college for nine years. And I didn't realize, I didn't know, I didn't know anything. When I got to college, it took, I was in Columbia and everybody in, in the Ivy League ran Princeton offense. I had no idea. And in, in fact, I realized why, why I did get my butt kicked by some other high school coaches because they were running some of these Princeton actions. that I had no, I had no idea what it was. So if you can learn as much as you can, um do it like coach yang is right um do it and and again santos that goes back to your your point of like having tough skin like you're gonna get rejected like you gotta have the courage you have to have the courage in any role that you're in know your place but you got to have the courage to like present something that you believe in you have to be able to present your basketball thoughts and ideas um to an assistant to your head coach if, if you have that opportunity um, Devin Perez, you want to ask your question? Uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes. Um, so my question is, I, I work for the women's basketball team at Mizzou, and um, I just want to know how you all may go about um, navigating job openings or pushing for jobs um, when you've done research on the staff and you see that they may have a lack of diversity. I know on the men's side it's it's a little different, but on the women's side you have to have – males, females, black, white, I mean, Asian, anybody. Um, And I just want to know as a young coach, um, do you still put in for those jobs uh, or do you hold off? And then do you sell that diversity once you get the interview or get the meeting that you may bring to the table? Hey, Devin, what's up, man? Uh, I I would say, you know, definitely you can only control you can control. I said earlier, and Everybody has to understand that it's not personal. It's all business. And there's some head coaches on here. They can also agree to that. And they've got to hire the best person for that job. They feel that's best. Sometimes it, you, you never know. A year or two from now, it may not be the best option, but at the time they felt right. You know, just like game day, I, I felt right. I'm going to run a two, three zone. This is what we're going to do. And so at the end of the day, you, you, you can't, I'm not saying you are, but you, you can't hold that against you uh, in regards to, looking at applying for jobs. I mean, there's a lot, especially on the women's side, like there's a lot of jobs programs out there that have more males than females on staff. And so um, I, I know it, it could be tedious work, but if you have time to apply, it doesn't hurt to apply. Um, and then they'll know your name. You know what I'm saying? It's all about branding yourself and know who you are for them to know who you are. Um, it does not hurt. Cause you know, um, I, I talked to someone, I forgot who it was, but they were talking about, somebody just applied for a job um, with, within the program. It, it wasn't even basketball related, just to get their foot in the door. You know what I'm saying? And, and eventually if, if the staff shifts, then you can probably work your way up. But at the end of the day, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold that against yourself. I mean, you, you can't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket, right? So applying is, is buying a ticket, you know? Yeah, and I- when I was when I was trying to become a GA, um, I I emailed. I might have emailed every <laughs> every program that had a Kines major, because that's what I or a sports management. I literally uh, did that, or a, a program that I wanted to be a part of. Um, they obviously had to have basketball. See if I can get on. Um, but a lot of it too is, I mean, if you don't do it, you're not. There's no. There's absolutely zero chance 
And if you do do it, you give yourself some chance. You know, there was, I'm not, there was a lot of programs who, who didn't reach back out to me. There were programs that did, and I kind of got somewhere and then it kind of died down. Um, but at the end of the day, if they don't know what you want or if, if um, you don't put yourself out there, sometimes you don't, you don't get the opportunity. And I mean, I, I guess my situation is way different because I reached out to everybody really besides Cal State Fullerton and I ended up at, at Cal State Fullerton. Um, but at the end of the day, they, the coaching staff at the time, they knew what I wanted to do, uh, what I was trying to do. Um, and that was be, be a GA. I didn't know what I wanted to do after that, but, um, they, that I was the first call that, that came, uh, once, once our interim head coach had, had gotten that title. And so, you know, you, you have to put yourself out there. Can I add to that too, real quick, Mike? Then I'll also say it, it's a way to polish your skills, like your applying skills. And I, and I say it cause that's real. Applying skills is real because you, you have to create a cover letter. And if you start copying and pasting, you, I think I've done it once, maybe twice, where you forget to <clears throat> take out the school. But once you start writing a cover letter, you, you start to ask yourself and test yourself, do I even want this school? Like you get very intimate about why you want that school. So I, whenever you apply to schools, it's not a matter of, oh, man, don't, don't think negative about that. Stay positive and say, you know what, I'm going to attack it like I'm the only person they're going for and why do I want the job and put that in the cover letter. And that's what they really read. The cover letter shouldn't say anything about your resume in a sense. It should say it's, it's an introduction of yourself. And they would really, you'll find yourself if you really do want to be there or not. Yeah, if any head coaches or, or anybody that hires or has an experience, feel free to, to join in this conversation. But I think, Devin, it is really important. It's good that you do know there is, there are factors of diversity on both the men's and women's side. Like on the men's side, like you said, it's different. There's factors like they're going to hire, they have to hire, I don't know if it's, it's like an unwritten rule, whatever, that they have to hire a minority. Uh, am I the right minority? I, I don't know, you know. And Anthony actually has a really good – like, Anthony doesn't think like that. Santos, he, he just – he doesn't think think in that way, and that's a good way to approach it. But I think it's important to understand the landscape. And I don't know the landscape in women, on the women's side, but I'm sure there's factors there too. Like you said, you have to know that. You have to know – you know, somebody once told me, he's like, what's your dream job, Coach Mike, when I first started, one of my – the my associate head coach. And, and I said, oh, UCLA, USC, because I'm from L.A. And he's like, who's on the staff there? And I was like, I have no idea. I'm here at Columbia, New York City. He's like, how do you not know that? And it's just, just something that, that put in my head, like, I should know that. If I really do, if that's my goal, I should know. And so for you, you're absolutely right. Then. Like, there are, there are things that you have to maneuver around, but I would never, ever not try. And I'm a perfect example of that. I wrote letters just like Anthony did. And, that's, and somebody responded and, and hired me, not necessarily from that letter, but gave me a shot to volunteer. And then it turned into – to a job so and Anthony said this yesterday like never ever ever like don't I mean you got to take your swing you got to go for it um but the truth is and anybody can chime in you most most people are going to hire from relationships a relationship that they have with you uh or with somebody that you know that that's just the truth you know like I've I've, I've sent tons even while I've been in the business I've tried and tried and tried to send all the jobs that I've gotten have come from somebody that I know that knows the guy that I'm working for. Um, that's, that's the truth. So the more relationships that you can build with, and it's just like sales. I was in, I was in the real estate world before that, or like a lot of you guys have been in the business world. It's just, there's no difference between our business of coaching and the business of real estate finance. It's the same thing. People hire based on relationships slash how competent, you are and how excellent you are at your job and how invaluable you can be to an organization. But a lot of it comes from a recommendation for somebody that you've already worked for. Um, all right, let's see. Uh, I'll add to that too, Mike, where you're looking for a question. Devin, it's, it's uh, who you know will help you get information about the job, who knows you will help you get the job, and what you know will help you keep the job. And I, I'm telling you, those, those things, for, for me, I hold that personal, man, it's, it's real. All right, I wish we, we, got, we, got, like, we got a few more minutes here. Um, we'd like to keep these to an hour. That was great, Coach Yang. Um, another question. Here's basketball-wise. This is from Joseph. This was the second part of his question. 
what is this is hard one what is something that affects the outcome of the game of basketball that isn't in the final box score I mean, there's a lot of stats you can keep from that. I mean, uh, you can take from deflections to, to uh, charges, um, um, paint touches. Anthony, I mean, is there anything special you all do at Florida 10 that's I mean, not possible? Yeah, paint touches is big, but I think uh, um, playing hard, which is crazy because kids are too cool sometimes. <laughs> how, do you uh, playing t- how do you measure that? Ah, that's a that's I think it's more of a I don't know if you can physically measure it put a number to it but you know if if we're talking about aggressiveness you know then you can look at their paint touches but uh, playing hard I mean it's it's uh, I don't know how to answer that one to well, be here's, honest here's one, uh, Anthony. It's, it's almost like a gauge well, I was gonna add Anthony a lot of schools are going with the uh what are those traps guys uh the heart rate monitors I forgot what they're called and I don't know if you guys yeah. are Fullerton. I mean, a lot of people use that to help gauge, are you playing hard? So, um, I, I don't know. Are, are you guys using that Fullerton or? No, we don't have the money for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a stab um, at. But no. no, no, it's not a stab. <laughs> I mean, a, a lot of that stuff is, is you know, you, you get the effort that your guys put in. You, you, you know you'll be happy. It doesn't matter if they make shots or not. Um, you know, obviously that's that's a that's a that's an angle. Obviously, making shots, winning a game. But if you know you play hard, like we've we haven't had we didn't have very many this year. Um, but there were times there were spurts throughout the year where we were like, man, this this group could be really really good if they play if they play together. Um, they're unselfish. Like I think those are things that don't show up on the box score. You know, unselfish maybe because you have assists, but um, unselfish is also making the extra pass or finding a way to get somebody else open or, ta- you know, running the lane um, so that way someone else can get a rim run finish at the, at the, uh, in transition. Like those are, those are small things that's being, that's what I consider as being unselfish and doing your part. It doesn't show up on the box score, but if, if a team isn't bought in for the other person's success, then that's, I mean, that's, that's a huge, that's a huge deal when it comes to a, wins and losses and I'm, I'm sure all you coaches on here um you can attest to that at some point you know where if one person would have just ran harder if one person would have blocked out you know that their person maybe didn't get the rebound so once again doesn't show up on the box score but it's it's an effort play and I don't think you can ever you can promote it um and guys guys and girls have to buy into it and I don't, I don't think that's a, that's ever anything that will show up in the box score, but it's probably one of the more invaluable things that, that can happen during a game. And you yeah. know, they say numbers don't lie. Film don't lie too, right? And so, that's a whole nother, yep. that's a whole nother, um, great film. You can, you can use film to teach. Um, and, uh, you know, there's something you talked about deflections, Steve, or like running hard to the corner, like things that you kind of think are unmeasurable. If you do have managers and staff willing to, and the box outs, things that you can have managers measure that and track that on a daily basis. But it t- does take work, and that's a whole nother talk. It's something that um, I've seen, and I'm sure you guys have seen with different different guys. Hey, Mike, um, different- I'll, I'll add a little bit to that, too. This is got funny. I don't know if anybody else does this, but a stat I take on the, on the bench is uh, fouls by officials. So I, I'll write the official's name. I'll, I'll write, keep track of all the officials and what, they, who, who, what they're calling. You know what I'm saying? I also keep track of travels and who like I'm serious like travels matter and who's taking the charge because um, travel goes back to fundamentals and for traveling I'll go back to coaches the coach man she we had seven travels well <laughs> we got to fix that you know what I'm saying and you know if, if you tell your team like hey this this referee is calling all the fouls like you got to watch out for him or her and that will really help out your your star player or whatnot but I think little things like that kind of does come into play um, you got to play chess with these kids and uh, especially with these officials as well, too. So, sorry, I just want to throw that out there. That's insane that you do that. That's crazy. <laughs> I will tell you this, all the young dudes, like, so you get assigned a task. So for instance, I, if, I, if there is a grad assistant in, in our program, we did, which we did this year, and his job was to measure box outs versus missed box outs. Like, let's just say, like, that was his role. role. You have to do that every day and 
I, I don't want to have to, or like a coach, coach doesn't want to have to hold you accountable. Like you have to do it every day. You have to stay with it every day and don't get distracted. Now, Anthony asked you to do something and then you forget about what, what Steve asked you. No, you have, if you get assigned something, you start something, you have to continue to do it all year long until, because that, because they value, they value that. And that's how, that's the kind of way you make yourself valuable to show that, Oh, this guy actually did box outs and missed box outs all 32 games of our season. Um, Alex Liu, uh, you want to ask your question, unmute yourself and ask your question, buddy. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we all spend a lot of time in the gym and, and, uh, make a lot of sacrifices. Um, what are some, uh, non-negotiable, non-negotiables you have personally and professionally? You know, uh, I had a really good talk with coach Mike Peck. Uh, he said, you know, professionally, you know, there's something like, you know, my guys has got to be in really, really good condition. You know, and, and there are cer certain uh, non-negotiables, you know, for other coaches, uh, maybe for like family or, or, or things for yourself, like maybe having enough sleep. You know, I've had conversations with that for, for certain coaches. So like, what are some non-negotiables you guys have? I think a, a big one for me is being present. You know, I'm, if I'm in the office or if I'm doing my skill work, I can't worry about what's coming after this. This is where I'm at. You know, this person is giving me their time. And so, let's let's work and at the in the same token i try to hold that um to our guys i'm i don't know if anyone from our staff is on here but i kick out guys from my workouts um whether it's skill hey you're not working hard you know go over there stand let me know when you're ready and you can come back in but my thing is i'm always if i'm gonna be prepared and i'm gonna be um teaching something or if it's whatever it is you need to be present because i put in my time you know, so what, whether it's an action, whether it's a scout, whether it's a skill development deal, um, I'm putting my time into this. So the least you could do is, you know, this is my way of helping you be present with what we're doing. If not, you know, take a seat, listen to what I'm saying, and then let's, let's keep it going. And sometimes if it's a one-on-one -on -one thing, you know, sometimes it's, it's five, seven minutes in, Hey, are you warm? Are you ready to go? Okay. And, and if, if they're not, then, you know, see ya. We're, we're not going to do this today. Um, and I just felt so I, me personally, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm hard on guys. Uh, but I, I recently listened to, to Phil Beckner talk and he, he kicks out pros 20 minutes in cause they're not ready. And so if, if I'm trying to help these guys get to that next level, be better in whatever it is we're working on as a, as an individual, as a, as a group, as a team, um, then I, I want, I want to make sure that I have their undivided attention. I know it's easier said than done. And so there's always, you know, you got to go back and forth. Sometimes you have to re-engage them. Um, but I think, you know, being present is, is a big thing for me professionally. And then with our, with our group. Yeah. Be present in the presence, man. I love that. That's big time. Uh, for, for me, I, I think it's all about <clears throat> timing. Uh, th that's the one thing that we all share in this world is time, right? We can't go backwards. We share time. I don't care how much money you make. You and I share that time. And so if I'm saying, hey, we need to be on the court at 11.57, we're going to be on the court at 11.57. And that's just me personally. Um, it, it, obviously, there's emergencies and stuff comes up. It is what it is. But um, I think we need a time really shows the respect of each other and, um, because we share that. So I'm with you on that, uh, Steve. All right, last question. This is from Daniel. This is a great question. For everybody on this um, for you too as someone who never played collegiate basketball how do you get buy-in with your players at your level uh, me, me start on that real quick so <clears throat> is everybody everybody here knows who the head coach is at Georgetown men's basketball I'm assuming Patrick Ewing right but a lot of the people they recruit I promise you they don't know who Patrick Ewing is or they just know a little bit of them and so <laughs> I'm like, dang, you're like, you're in the same boat as me, Pat, to an extent, but he's about 10 feet taller than me. But, you know, uh, the, the thing is people and I, on the woman's side, it's like, it's like, they don't know uh, what you know until you know what they know and, and you love what they love. I think people, I, I tell whenever I was recruiting, I tell parents, like, you want your kids playing for someone who looks the part or knows the part. That's a huge difference, right? And so once you're confident in yourself, once you know what the heck you're talking about, I think people are starting to trust you and buy in. But you have, you have to build that relationship early so that that player can really trust and that you know what the heck, heck you're talking about. 
um, we were on the bench one game, and uh, me, me and my video coordinator, she, she, I think she might be on her, but we were just on the bench, and we're calling out, you know, saying the actions that the other team is going to be doing. Our, our team was like, our players like, how do y'all know that stuff? Like, we watch film. <laughs> we know what's going to happen. We watch film. And so they, they start to respect you because they know you know. So um, at the end of the day, it's, it's being confident in yourself and not arrogant in a sense. And, um, you know, kids will start to respect you that way too. Yeah, and I, I, a lot of it for me, um, when I came in, I was, I was younger. I'm not, I don't think I'm that old now. But, um, you know, being fresh out of college, my, my easiest thing was I was young. I could relate to these dudes a lot easier than probably some of our other staff. And so I used that to my advantage, whether it was, you know, talking about a certain class or um, talking to them more as a friend versus a, a, an ops or a GA or a video guy or whatever. I try to put my own twist on our relationship to where I can get information from them. But at the same time, you know, give them another viewpoint in terms of uh, from a different staff member. Maybe we compromise. We find some middle ground on certain things. Maybe it's sometimes, hey, you know, I acknowledge I did something wrong, but sometimes it's giving myself up to let them understand, like, hey, we're on the same, we're on the same playing field. I'm not above you. I'm not below you. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, I want the best for you. And sometimes it's, it's relaying that message. So I think re relatability um, is one thing. And then kind of like what Steve said is, is the prep work. If they know I'm prepared, Whatever it is, skill-wise, if, if we're teaching a screening action, how to guard something, um, a scout, personnel, like, I have to be detailed. I have to know what I'm talking about. I got to know um, every little nuance because if they're going to ask a question, and I'm sure we all have these types of players where they just ask some – we have players that ask a question just to ask it, which I, I love because, once again, you get to reiterate your point, and now, hey – you know, in the middle of a huddle, you can always go back. Hey, you asked that question earlier. You should know it. And so now I'm holding them accountable. Um, but then also there's going to be a question where, you know, maybe it didn't, it didn't really come up in, in the scanning report because, you know, that's not what the, that's not what you do. Or there might be a clip of something that you may, you might not have touched on. But as soon as they ask the question, you're prepared because you know what you did. You know the work that you put in. You've watched however many games. Um, and you've done all your work beforehand for them to know that, hey, you ask me a question, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, and then you better get, make sure you get it right. And I'm going to ask you again. And once again, it's, it's the checks and balances, I think, is, is a huge deal in terms of getting those, those players to, to buy in with what I'm saying. Um, so that way they execute and they play to the best of their ability. Mike, can I add a little bit to that, too? Like sometimes, and, and, if you, and if you play college basketball in here or professionally, and you're coaching now, sometimes that could backfire in a sense where I've heard players say, well, he wants me to be like what he was, and I'm like, not like him, or she, whatever. You know, and so, you know, just like a dad, like you want your son to be like you or be the, the person that you never uh, were growing up. So sometimes you got to be careful that you, whenever you're coaching these kids, that they may not be the stud that you were back then. And so you're coaching them and using their strengths to their abilities and helping them to be the best they can be, not the best that you think they can be of yourself. If that makes sense. You guys, you guys nailed it, I think. Relationship is huge. You have to, if you don't, you have to build it and you'll know and you gotta have some feel and you gotta have some people skills. And if you, you'll know when it's time for you to, to, I guess, impart your coaching voice onto him but like it's definitely something that I thought about when I first started as well like I got into college coaching I finally got my crack to be on the floor and and I was nervous as heck and and where I am I mean you're, you'll improve it's just like the old theory of 10,000 hours like you got to put your hours in to get that your coaching voice will naturally improve but you have to have that relationship first and foremost for you to even think that you can coach somebody like that 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 is key and then the second part of it like both these guys said like I'll use my buddy, for example, who was at the Cleveland Cavs, like really great college player, really intelligent, and LeBron James trusted him because all they really care about is that you know what you're talking about. If you don't and you screw that up one time, it's over. Like you, you get, so, like, if you don't know, it's okay. Like, you just you, – you, you know what you know, and when you know something, you should have complete confidence in it. Um, I think we should close this out. I just want 
Steve, I don't know if I'll put you on the spot here. If you, you want to just have like a closing message and we'll let you close it out, Anthony, and then we'll, we'll close this thing out for, for our group here. Yeah, I just want to thank you guys. Thank everybody on here. Uh, you know, this isn't really – this Asian Coaches Association hosting it, but it's really everyone. And, um, you know, we want to grow, and we want to grow our, our, our community and everybody that's involved. And so I want to thank you guys so much for this. Um, and like I said earlier, man, just don't take anything personal. Um, everybody's fighting for the same job or a job, and we're here to help each other out. Um, it, it's, you got to be genuine, got to be legit and, and, and really fight and go after it. But, um, I, I would say keep working hard and people say, what's, what is grind? What, what is hard work? They, they don't, everybody's always asking or saying that not knowing really what grind is. My thing is also be intentional about a lot of things you do, um, and building relationships because we've been talking about relationships and all that too, but they don't know that, you know, basketball, I say they like the hiring people. They don't know, you know, basketball, if you don't give that, yourself that opportunity to talk basketball. But you can't always want to talk basketball with them. You know, if you're out grabbing a drink or something, you're at the Final Four, you see a coach, like, they want to just let loose, man. And, and you're over here talking X's and O's, and they, they want to just enjoy the moment. So, you know, I, my kids watch a little show called Daniel Tiger, and, and they always say this thing called enjoy the wow that's happening now. And that's what I believe in. Like, this is the wow. You're at the Final Four or you're in – you're right here at this Zoom meeting. Enjoy this wow. And then it, and then it, it will start to grow in you. But um, I, would, I would encourage everybody to build that relationship. Um, say what's up to each other, man. Uh, stay in touch with people. I think that's huge, too. And get to know one another because you never know. You guys might be working with someone on this phone call or something or someone on this call might know someone that you know to get to where you want to be. And um, be flexible. Uh, sacrifice is one, but be flexible, be willing to move out, you know, whether it's East Coast, Midwest or so. Uh, Carrie, if, I don't know if she's still on there, but she's out in Alaska coaching. And, and, you know, I don't know how many people would go to Alaska, but that's crazy. You know, it's great. Would you move to Alaska for a job? And she did. And so that's the thing. Like, you guys have to understand what you're willing to give up to get. So thank you guys so much. Thank you, uh, Mike and Anthony and Garrett. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, Steve. Mr. Geographically Flexible, that's the new term. We create geographic. Both of us been around, but being geographically flexible is a huge part of this job. Um, Anthony? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, for everyone on here, I think everyone aspires to be something, get to a certain level, um, do certain things. I think you, along those lines, you just have to be your biggest critic. Um, if, if you're not your biggest critic, if you're not self-aware of you, what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong, how you could be better, um, you're not helping, you're not doing a service to yourself. And so I think if you can have that self-awareness and, and continually to continuously critique yourself and, and force yourself to be better, um, you obviously help yourself a lot. Um, and, and there's going to be times where you're, there's going to, there's going to be a gut check, you know, am I, am I real, do I really want to do this? Is this really what I want? Cause I'll tell you what, I had plenty of those moments when I wasn't making, you know, very much money or I was tired, I was worn out. Um, and, and when you get through those times, you'll know, you'll know, but there's always going to be another time where you gut check yourself. Like I was told no several times uh, for different jobs. I turned down a job. Um, and then you question yourself like, well, is this really what I want? I, I've literally been asking myself that from the very beginning um, before I even started, before I even was a manager. And so I think if you can be honest with yourself, that'll be a big deal. Um, and, and how much you can grow, how much you can push yourself forward. And then um, I'll just say this, obviously, thanks for everyone that's here. But if, if you need, if you want to talk, if you want to text, if you have a question about anything, uh, for, feel free to text me, email me, my stuff's in the chat. Or if for some reason you get off, uh, Garrett, uh, Mike, give my information. Um, I, I, don't, I, I understand, you know, that it's, it's a hard business to crack at times. Um, but if you're persistent enough, um, you know, these people on, the, on this call, myself, Steve, Mike, you know, reach out to us. I know, sure, we got different things going on. But at the end of the day, I, I, I understand. Like, I personally understand because I was in that seat. I, I know it's hard. Um, and the, the, la the only thing that I, I know I can do is, is to try and help however I can, whether it's, you know, I don't know if we can, if I can help you get a job or if I can connect you with somebody. 
Um, sometimes it's, it's a lot of the time it's not about, you know, just networking. It's, it's the relationships you build with these people, how you see them. Like I, there's a couple people on here that, you know, I wanted to hire somebody and he just, it just wasn't the right time for him. Um, but once again, it's, it's the relationship. It's, it's how you get to know these people, um, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, definitely do what you can to, to help yourself, but more importantly, help, help the person next to you. Well, thank you, Steve and, and Anthony. We appreciate it. That was, that was awesome to get us kicked off here. And I was super excited. Um, I was more nervous than any, any other Zoom I've been on for this thing, but I'm just, I was just so excited to, to see what, what the community that we have built. So it, like Anthony said, like, let's utilize it. It's a platform for us and, and a community that we can hopefully use to help each other. And um, so thank you guys. And, and you can just hit us on our Twitter or Instagram if you don't. I mean, you can find me, email me anytime um, and, and, and these guys. But thank you guys for showing up in, in the next in two weeks. We're probably going to do something um, again. And it'll be uh, probably some basketball, X's and O's involved. And, and we'll, uh, we'll let you guys know. But thank you guys so much. Thanks, Steve and Anthony. Cool. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate you guys.